I hope that the recording works. The topic of today is very amusing and uh, simple-minded. We will talk about cross ratios. and PGL2. And the week afterwards, we will come back to the definition of moduli spaces and uh, universal family and all this categorical stuff. Okay? So for today, today, it's just amusement, cross ratios, and so on. So I want to give you a drawing. Assume we make a picture of a city. Make a photograph. And the scenery is a city with a river. So assume that we have here a river. I try to draw this in perspective. And then we have, a, we have houses here and maybe a street. One house, and then we have another one uh, here. Everything is, of course, photographed in perspective. I cannot draw it like this. And uh, that's what we see on our photograph. Now, assume, assume that we know we can, we want to know the width of the River. So we want to know this distance. So what is W in reality? The width of river. And we just have the photograph, but we have one additional information. We know the real size of the houses. So let me call this here. A and B. So we know, and that's part of the assumption, we know A, B, the real length of houses. And then we know something else. So here this is W. We can measure on the photograph and the photograph dimension, photo dimensions. No? The photo is just <coughs> a rectangle, a piece of paper, essentially. So let me call these small x. Now here we have small y and c uh, and z. Okay. So these are x, y, and z, and these are so where are these are meters. We have here maybe centimeters. Okay. So we have five input data. And one output. And the problem is, can we compute w? This is again in meters. Okay. So now, if we formalize the situation, <coughs> we have. I think I make the the usual drawing. We have seen this already. As we are looking in perspective, we have this situation. And now we can draw what we know. We know x, y, and z. And we know a and b. And we want to know w. Okay. And the claim is that there is a rule to compute this. 
Now, what is the definition of the cross ratio? And we are just from the real line. We take z1, z2, z3, z4. So <clears throat> apparently, this was already used by Papus of Alexandria. Something like 300 after Christ. Implicitly. So <clears throat> to make a long story short, I just give you the definition. Let me write it like this. We treat that for the moment z1, z2, z3, and z4 as variables. So we group them in two groups. Let me write it like this to emphasize c3, z4. And we take the following differences. We take this difference and this difference, the distance. And then we take this one and this one. Okay. And we take the product, respectively, the quotient. So you all probably have seen the formula z1 minus z3, z2 minus z4. I assume that I'm on the real axis, no? z1 minus z4 and z2 minus z3. OK, that's the famous cross ratio. And you see that the first two entries play a different role from the second two. Right? So if you permute z1 and z2, then the sign will change, but nothing else. And if you permute both z1, z2, and z3, z4, then you get the same. So this will be equal to <coughs> z2, z1, z4 z3. Okay. And we will see many more formulas like this between various cross ratios. Now once we have this, we just have to know that this cross ratio is invariant. So this is the main feature. This quotient is invariant under projectivity. And not only it is invariant, I will explain what it means. It's all also essentially the only one which is invariant. So what does it mean to invariant? That if you take a projection, not a projection, a projective map, then <coughs> this quotient remains the same. <coughs> Excuse me. So here, it just means, <coughs> so what are the distances? We have to go from this point to this one. So this is y plus z times this distance, which is x plus y, divided by x plus y plus z times y. OK. So we have these four points, z1, z2, z3, z4. That's precisely the cross ratio. This is the same as <coughs> a plus w times b plus w divided by a plus b plus w times w. And from this, you get w. Okay. So that's a practical example where you can use the cross ratio to compute something. Of course, uh, that's completely standard in, in, in 
geometry, but it's nice. Okay. So I'm running out of liquid, but I will do. I'll continue at least a little bit. So we will do a little bit about projective geometry, <coughs> and then come back to the algebra, which is behind cross ratios. Okay. So we will work both over the reals and the complex numbers. So let k be a field, p1 k will be a1 k minus 0 mod k star projective line. Where a one k is just k itself, but we will write it like this because it corresponds to f line line. And of course, two points x is equivalent to y, if and only if there's a lambda in k star, y equals lambda times x. Okay. Now, typically. k will be r or c. And then we can see this as a topological space, p1r. So this can either be seen as the real line union at point at infinity, or though this means correspond, so you have a, a homomorphism. S1 in R2, the one sphere. And of course, all, all our pictures will be real, but we also think of the complex line C, which is again C. This is what is called the one point compactification. So C is a real plane, and you add one point, and then you will get S2 in R3, the two sphere. So these two are real. Okay? If you look at it as a real manifold. So <clears throat> we can work, so we'll do both. We will work with projective coordinates here, but we will also work as being in C and treating infinity as a separate point. So the affine charts, of course, most of you are very familiar with this, but let me be complete. So we take u, uh, how do I want to call it? Now we are again over an arbitrary field. We take x, y. We write the points as projective points in p1. Here we take x different 0, and u to the points in p1. y is non 0. And this will be isomorphic to a1, sending x, y to y divided by x. And here again, this is a1, sending x, y to x over y. And the chart transition map, the transition map, goes from a1 minus 0 to a1 minus 0, sending z to 1 over z. Inversion. Okay. So the real picture 
of the charts. So you think of P1R as a circle. And then the first chart will be everything except the North Pole. And the second chart will be everything except the South Pole. Now, my two yellow circles, my, my not yellow, but the two yellow curves are isomorphic to the real line. And the gluing or the transition happens here. Okay. So that's the covering by real charts. So here in this transition map, often one forgets the zero and just thinks of not being defined in zero. OK. Now we have the action of the general linear group in two by two matrices. GL2K acts on A2K, which I identify just with K2. It depends if you think of schemes or varieties or just uh, topological spaces by matrix multiplication. So <clears throat> I have to write now elements in A2 as column vectors in order to have a well-defined multiplication. Okay, So this is a linear isomorphism of A2. And of course, it sends lines to lines, sending lines to lines. So it induces. I explained this already in the first class that the points of projective of the projective line correspond to lines through zero in A2, sending lines to lines. Thus, GL2K induces an action on P1K. And I want to <coughs> compute this action to see it more concretely how this works. So now the trick is to go to affine coordinates. So we now we treat, think of P1K as K union infinity. So we take Z which corresponds to x. Let's, let us work in this chart, x over y. OK. And x, y in a2. So sometimes I write it as a row, sometimes as a column, whatever is more convenient. Well, maybe I should write it as a column. Sorry for this. Otherwise, we will be have a lot of confusion. So x, y in A2. So let me write A, A, B, C, D in GL2K. And we get A, x, y will be a x plus b y c x plus d y. Sorry, it's a vector. This was too optimistic. Okay, and uh, so maybe I write this like this. Here behind we have a acting on z. We want to find what is A applied to Z. So this will be here this column vector. 
And recall, we go from the vector x, y to the projective point uh, by dividing x divided by y. If y is 0, we just take infinity here. And not both are 0, so we are outside 0, of course. OK? So now, here, we can write this as, now, this goes, if we take now the fraction, to ax plus by divided by cx plus dy. So this z here is in p1 equals k in an infinity. And now here we are again in p1, but still with affine coordinates, x and y. But this now can be written, we divide by y, and we get a x over y plus b, c x over y plus d. I hope you can still see this. Let me check. Yes. And this here is nothing else. Now we can write z again for x over y. This is a z plus b c z plus d. So this proves that the action of GL2 on P1 is by Möbius transformations. Very simple computation, but one has to do it once in your life to be convinced that that's correct. Okay. By the way, it is, it's funny, but it is much more relaxed to do a recording than to do a live transmission. Surprising, but it is like this. So we get GL2K acts on P1K by Möbius transformations. As was already said uh, a long time ago. But of course, if we multiply a, the matrix A equal A, B, C, D, and if we take lambda in K star, then lambda times A acts as A. Because the lambda will cancel in the fraction, so this means that PGL2K, which is defined as GL2K up to homothesis K star, acts on P1K. And that's the action we want to study. So it is again. I'll just write A now, but A times Z, AZ plus B z plus d. And this works also when z, so if z is minus d over c, then a of z is infinity. And uh, if z is infinity, we also have to declare what this is, then a times infinity, so this is just a d divided by c because you can cancel, OK? By definition or by continuity. So how are we going with our time? Yeah, this, of course, this PGL2 has a proper name, the projective general linear group, of course, of size t, two, of size 2.
And as we already mentioned, but I write it down again, proposition PGL 2K acts on P1K sharply three transitive. So what does this mean for all pairwise distinct triples Z1, Z2, Z3 in P1K? So triples are the Z, uh, distinct are the ZI. And all pairwise distinct triples w1, w2, w3. So this is in p1k to the 3, sorry. There exists a unique, so the transitivity is the existence and sharply means the uniqueness, a in pgl. 2k, sending zi to wi. All i equal to 1, 2, 3. So we will prove this. I always say to my student that this is an exercise in linear algebra. And at first they don't believe it, but then it's quite clear. Catch again the proof. Uh, da -da. Any linear isomorphism of A2 is given by the images of a basis of A2 as a vector space. And these images can be chosen arbitrarily. But of course, linearly independent. So your basis goes to basis. Okay. So these are vectors. Now we are talking about vectors. But in the projective setting, we are talking about lines. So <clears throat> let me draw these two vectors, v and w in A2. And we can send them anywhere w prime d prime. And then, uh, let me call it phi, that's phi is unique. But now, when we extend this a little bit, if we consider instead the lines generated by these vectors, then we, u, we lose the uniqueness of phi. So let me write here, there exists a unique phi in yellow. But now, if we just require that the lines are sent to each other, if, let me write it in phi, let me call this 
L and K. And here we have, which one is which one? V prime, this is L prime, this is K prime. If phi is just required to send L to L, K to K prime, then we have one degree of freedom. Then phi is no longer unique. Why is this the case? Because lambda times phi does the same. The same job. Lambda in k star. So by choosing lambda suitably, we are able to move a third line. Now let me try it in green. If we now take this line and call it m and m prime. So we can choose lambda, and I invite you to do it on your own. <coughs> May choose, that's very easy, lambda such that phi of m equals m prime. And then phi is unique. OK? Please think about it again. It's very simple, elementary. OK. So if we try to do the same thing for four points in P1, we cannot send them to any choice of four other points. I repeat, four pairwise distinct points cannot be sent to arbitrary four pairwise distinct points. That's just not possible. Let me write this as a remark. That's not a good one. Remark four distinct points that one that four in P one are sent. under A in PGL 2K. So maybe I should add here again pairwise existing points are sent under A to four pairwise distinct points. W1, W4 in P1, which are no longer arbitrary. So and there is precisely one condition. They have to fulfill precisely one condition, namely to have the same cross ratio as Z1 up to Z4. That's like a miracle. It's not very deep, but <clears throat> it's nice. Okay. 
and I repeat I repeat the picture from what we had already three or four times. Of course, this is an, a fine picture, but think of these lines as having a point in it, at infinity. So here we have a P1. Here we have a P1. And uh, what I'm saying is that this could be z1, z2, z3, z4, w1, w2, w3, w4. And over the reals, any action or any projective transformation, Möbius transformation, is precisely given by this picture. So over r, any <coughs> Möbius transformation phi from P1R to P1R is given what is called by a projectivity as depicted in the picture, in the figure. Okay. One has to do the computation. I'm not going to do it, but that's the case. So in this first half of the lecture, I want to show you that the cross ratio is indeed invariant. So if you apply to z1, z2, z3, z4 a Möbius transformation, then indeed the cross ratio stays the same. And uh, to do this, we can use a trick. So <clears throat> what is the trick? So let me write here, we have phi, let me call it phi equals phi of a from p1k Sometimes I write it below, sometimes I write the k in parentheses. So a will be a, b, c, d. And then phi of z is a, z plus b, c, z plus d. And we have four points. We have z1 minus z2, well, sorry, z3, z2 minus z4 divided by z1 minus z4 times z2 minus z3. So you see, that's not funny to plug in phi into this formula. This is z1, z2, z3, z4. So one rule in mathematics is be lazy. So what does this mean? Do the minimum to prove things. And in this situation, you save your life or your time by observing that PGL2 k is generated as a group by three things, translations. 
z goes to z plus b. Homothesis, z goes to a, z, a in k star. Here is b in k. And finally, inversion. z goes to 1 over z. That's easy to see. And once you have observed this, you are done. Because it is clear that the translation will keep this fraction here, because it cancel, the b will cancel in the differences. If you multiply all zi with a again, the a will cancel. And if you invert, let me do the last one, you get 1 over z1 minus 1 over z3 times 1 over z2 minus 1 over z4 divided by 1 over z1 minus 1 over z4 1 over z2 minus 1 over z3. Now you multiply with the product of the zi, and you get z3 minus z1, z4 minus z2, divided by z4 minus z1, z3 minus z2, and that's just the cross ratio. OK? So you are done. That's easy. Very good. So you can think about, uh, in the break, you may want to think about why this is a unique invariant. So where can I write this? Remark the cross ratio is the only PGL2 invariant on. Now you have to take care where you have where you are acting. We are acting on four two tuples. So we have to take P1k to the power of four, but we have to avoid uh, equal points. So pairwise distinct, this means pairwise distinct points. So this is what is called the big diagonal. Actually, one can take a slightly smaller one, and it still works. But this will be after the break. OK. So <clears throat> five minutes break. I will continue my recording tomorrow. Uh, but uh, you see, that's material which is very easy to digest. And we continue soon. Bye bye. OK, we continue with our discussion of cross ratios. So before the break, we have seen already that, oh, I need the micro. So I hope that the transmission works. So if we have zi in p1, k, four points, then we define z1, z2, z3, z4 as the quotient z1 minus z3, z2 minus z4, divided by z1 minus z4, z2 minus z3. Okay. And this will be a value. So it depends. Let me maybe, oh, I need uh, something to clean. So it depends a little bit whether you treat this as variables or whether you want to see this as evaluations. So let me do it here. This is a 
in the field of four variables, rational function fields in four variables, so zi will be treated as variables. And now if you want to evaluate, in let's say zi equals xi in p1, so this maybe I should have put parentheses. So we distinguish between variables. This is just a rational expression and substituting. So this makes sense. The quotient is defined in P1K. Whenever so there is one condition, so maybe I find a better pen. Whenever no three of the xi are equal, so this either works very well. So I'm still looking for good pens. So <clears throat> repeat, we can take this as an expression in variables, but we can also take values in p1. And then the expression only makes sense if no three are equal. Okay, And then in this case, the cross ratio can take any value, z1, z2, z3, z4 can assume any value in p1k except, now if you work it out, except three special values, 1, 0, and infinity. Okay. So this is to check. And uh, we will come back to this condition a little bit later. So what happens if, sorry, sorry, this, <clears throat> this was too fast. Uh, sorry, I have to add here, if all I have to specify a little bit more. I apologize. If all xi are pairwise distinct, so please add this here. If all the entries are pairwise distinct, so xi will correspond to actual values in the projected. If all are pairwise distinct, then the value is in p1k except 0, 1, and infinity. And uh, it takes a value in 1, 0, infinity if and only if <coughs> uh, not all xi are pairwise distinct. And we will discuss these cases separately. So you may have xi equal xj for some ij. Of course, ij different. But keeping the condition, as always, that no three are equal. OK? So if. 3 xi are equal, the evaluation is not defined. So I invite you to, to check this on your own, because it gives you a feeling 
how the cross ratio works. And it's really uh, quite astonishing how these special values come into play. And we will profit of this later on. Okay? So all this is an exercise. Do all this at home. And we will discuss it later in the class again. So that's <coughs> one thing about the cross ratios. So I want to come back to the PGL2 and then tell you more about uh, these cross ratios. So we already had, recall, PGL2K was GL2K mod K star. And this was also SL2K mod plus minus 1. And we wrote matrices A equals A, B, C, D. And uh, this uh, PGL2 acts sharply three transitive on P1K. Now this will allow us to move four points uh, in a certain special position, assume given x1, x4 in P1, pairwise distinct, then the orbit, so we can act on all four simultaneously. So let me write PGL2K times, now I write x1, x2, x3, x4. <coughs> as a vector. So this will be now in p1k to the power 4. This is the orbit. Orbit of 4 tuple. And the 4 tuple will also be called a 4 gun. You could think of it, if you take k, the complex numbers, you could think of this as a quadrilateral in the real plane. So this would be quadrilateral in P1C. K equals C. So now we already have uh, a first uh, normal form problem. We want to put this into a certain place in p1 to the 4. And that's easy because we can move, by the action of PGL2, we can move x1 to the point 0, x2 to the point 1, and x3 to the point infinity. So take p1k as c union infinity. And then inside here, we will have this, the three special points, 0, 1, and infinity. Of course, choosing just these is a matter of taste. There is no deeper reason at your taste. You could take any other three, <coughs> but notationally, that's the easiest thing to do. So now you will see a little bit how the whole machine with cross ratios and the action of PGL2 works. It's really a kind of funny thing.
So using A in PGL to K, we may move x1, x2, x3, x4 to the point 0, 1, infinity. And now this will be x4 tilde. OK. And x4 tilde will be unique with a unique x4 tilde in p1k. But it will be distinct from the theasis, so it will be minus 0, 1, and infinity. Okay. Now, uh, fact, this x4 tilde is nothing else than the cross ratio of x1, x2, x3, x4. Maybe up to permutation. So let's check it. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to do it. Let me compute 0, 1, infinity, x4 tilde. So this would be 0 minus infinity. 1 minus x4 tilde. We don't care to have infinity inside. And then we have 0 minus x4 tilde, 1 minus infinity. So now we have to work correctly. And you see that 0 minus infinity gives minus infinity. Below, you also have minus infinity. So you can cancel infinity. You get mi 1 minus x4 tilde divided by minus x4 tilde, which will give you uh, 1 minus 1 over x4 tilde. So this is the same as uh, x1, x2, x3, x4, no? Because in the orbit, we have the same cross ratio. So now you can compute x4 tilde from this one, OK? So it's not precisely this. So we have to take here up to a suitable permutation. So these details, we will do them in the notes. I don't want to discuss all this in class. I will be only confusing myself and yourself as well. OK. So this is kind of a normal form position. Yeah. Yes. So the orbit, let us discuss a little bit how big the orbit is. So let's take k equals r or c, then pgl 2 of k will be a real or complex Lie group. So it will be a smooth manifold and, of course, a group. And the group operations are differentiable. They are either real differentiable or they are complex differentiable holomorphic. It will be a real complex group of dimension. So we have the matrices have four entries, A, B, C, D. We can assume here that AD minus BC 
equals 1. This reduces the dimension by 1. And then we still have this action of plus minus 1, but plus minus 1 does not change the dimension. So this is of dimension 3 as a manifold. So the orbits are three-dimensional. Hence, the orbits PGL 2k times x inside what I'm doing here. No, that doesn't make sense. I wanted to say something else. Excuse me. So let me indicate you two more things. The first is uh, the how does the cross ratio behave under permutation? Behavior of cross ratio. under permutation. So we can do it again for variables. I already mentioned that z1, z2, z3, z4 is the same as z2, z1, z4, z3. And that's also the same. Now we can. Also switch uh, Z3, Z4, Z1, Z2. And let me call this lambda. And now we have many more permutations. Uh, we have one more here, sorry. This will also be equal to Z4, Z3, <coughs> Z2, Z1. So these four permutations yield the same lambda, the same cross ratio. Now, the remaining, so here we have already four permutations on four elements. So the remaining 20 permutations, all together we have 24 permutations of z1, z2, z3, z4 yield the values so you may have 1 over lambda i will give you the list in the notes 1 minus lambda 1 over 1 minus lambda and lambda minus 1 over lambda okay so each time, four permutations will yield the same cross ratio. Okay. So that's uh, these ratios are quite famous. They have a special name. They are sometimes called unharmonic subgroup of SU two. So this has historical reasons. Let me write this down. They are, of course, special Möbius transformations. 
these are special Möbius transformations. of the variable lambda. OK, so the identity 1 over lambda, 1 minus lambda, 1 over 1 minus lambda, and lambda minus 1 divided by lambda. So we have, uh, we get the group forming the so-called Unharmonic subgroup of all Möbius transformations, and this group is isomorphic to S3, the group of permutations of three elements. Okay. Now, one more comment, and then we will talk a little bit about the history. A nice, so there are many stories about cross ratios. No? If you look up the literature of the internet, you will find many nice properties. One nice property is the following over k equals c, we have the following uh, then and let me write xi for elements in p1k i equals 1 to 4 so I'll try at least at the beginning to distinguish between variables and points and whenever we have these four points here we could also take them actually outside infinity by moving them away from infinity. So we can assume, actually, that xi are in a1k without loss of generality. Okay. And then if we take x1, x2, x3, x4, then we can check whether this is in r, okay. or maybe in r union infinity. And this holds if and only if the xi's are real collinear, so they lie on a real line, or they lie on a real circle, or xi are real cocyclic. on a circle. So you see, nice property. OK, that's about the sum of the algebra behind cross ratios. I want to give you uh, one uh, more comment on the development of the concept of cross ratios, the historical uh, of course not all all historical ingredients, but at least uh, one or two interesting facts which appeared in the history in the study of cross ratios. So projective geometry was <clears throat> very popular in the 19th century. I'm back. 
here I am. So a little bit of history. I already mentioned Papus. So this was in book seven. So this is, of course, he did not call these values cross ratios, but he had the concept and the observation about projectivities. Then there's in 1803, there's Lazare Carnot, 1803. So he had a, an article or a book, Geometry de position. And uh, the, the name cross ratio in French was not used. It was called rapport anharmonique. So I did not figure out yet what this un here means, but I will give you in a moment uh, a geometric picture for this. And then in German, in Germany, it was Karl von Staudt. So this was around 1850 who kind of formalized axiomatically axiomatic description of cross ratios so without using the lengths, just talking intrinsically. And so the name was Doppelverhältnis in German. And this in, in in, Spain, in Spanish, this is reflected by razón doble. Okay. So, there was the following issue, uh, what they treated. So he had a theory which he called Wolf theory. So the theory of throws, this is no longer a name which is used, but I will give you at least one uh, aspect of it. So the, the point was the following, given x1, x2, x3, let me just take in r, three pairwise distinct points. Find x4 in R such that the cross ratio x1, x2, x3, x4 is minus 1. Possibly we should investigate why they took minus 1 that's like they did. And they called this x4, uh, got a special name. It was called the projective harmonic conjugate to x1, x2, x3. So maybe, maybe one of you in the audience wants to look at this more closer, and once in a while we'll give a short resume of the history or these aspects. For the time being, I will just make you a drawing how you can construct this. So <clears throat> you do the following. So assume that we have here the real line, and I will draw x1 here, x2 x3, and then you take a 
the point above, which is kind of the center of projection, and you take the connecting lines to x1 and x2. And then you choose a further point here. And now you connect as follows. You connect these two points. You connect these two points. And then you also connect these two points. And you get an intersection point. Now, my drawing is a, a little bit, maybe I move this point a little bit. Yeah. So if, when you connect now these two, this need not be perpendicular to the basis. You get an intersection point here, and that's the point x4. OK, so there's an elementary dramatic construction which reflects projectivity and cross ratios. Okay. Easy to prove. I don't want to do it here. Okay. So and I started the class about, about cross ratios with this photograph and measuring distances in real in reality, starting from measuring distances on the photograph. So that's the first overview about cross ratios. We will use much more about them during the class. But next time, I will go back to the abstract theory of moduli spaces. And we will define the moduli problems, moduli functors, and moduli spaces, together with the concept of universal family. So please. Look up yourself references about cross ratios, and I'll be very happy if you contribute more details and interesting facts about cross ratios. So that's all for today. This was recorded in advance, but of course, using Zoom, we can discuss this now in more detail, and you are you're invited to ask questions or to make more comments. Thank you, and see you next time.